So that's why you're in a, a very decidedly non-virtuous cycle of rising and rising costs like this, okay? Is because the revenue is a cap on the expenditures. Now, the second thing, or debate, this Bowen's hypothesis here, has three components to it. The second really important notion is what economists call an experienced good. An experienced good is a, um, a good or a service that, that as a consumer, you do not know what the quality of that good or service is before you buy it. The only way you can find out what the quality is, literally, is to buy it. Now, a lot of you students have found that when you've uh, signed up for a course, all right, uh, hoping that it would be a really high class course and find out oh, what a dog this is, you know. Or you may have your expectation ex exceeded by somebody who really does a bang up job in the class, all right? But you don't know beforehand, and you don't know until after you, uh, uh, after you, you purchased it. This is clearly true for an education, uh, not only just a single class, but once you finish your, your experience at an institution, you really don't know how much leverage a degree from that institution is going to have, for sure, uh, in terms of um, future job employment uh, opportunities, things like that. Now, the only ones you would really know, you would feel really certain about, is, um, uh, is going to a top-ranked private school or a top-ranked public institution like UBerkeley. Uh, do you think that high-cost high in college is yeah, that's what I was saying in, from the beginning is that is that uh, it is a uh, is a bottleneck on the economic ladder going up because if you can't get through it, you can't afford to get through it, and you can't get a good solid experience uh, um, because you don't have enough money, money to go to a higher quality institutions, you're starting off at a disadvantage. All right, so yes, it's part of the problem. It's part of the, uh, the economic mobility problem. It's part of the Income distribution problem. You know we're all we're all contributing to that. Okay, now experienced goods. They can operate efficiently, uh, and the, there are four conditions under which uh, they can operate efficiently. If if the uh, the consumer buys the, the the good or service frequently, and secondly, if the consumer can evaluate the quality immediately after purchasing it, all right? And third, if there are only two parties to the transaction, that is the consumer and the provider, but we know there are multiple parties in every higher education transaction because students don't pay the full load, right? There are people who are providing scholarships, taxpayers are providing, providing support, things like this. So all of the parties to the transaction are not in there. And let's see. The final thing is that if the consumers are willing to abandon low quality providers immediately when they find that they're producing or supplying a low quality product, none of those four conditions are satisfied in higher ed. None of them, right? So what that tells you immediately is that this market is inherently going to be inefficient. Now the consequence of being inefficient is higher cost. It's going to be higher cost and the unraveling of quality. These are the two prominent um, predictions from the theory of experienced goods. The costs are going to be higher than they would be otherwise, and the fact that over time, the quality of the services being provided is going to unravel over time. All right? That appears to correspond to what we've observed in the past four decades in higher education in terms of unraveling quality uh, and higher costs. So another aspect of the experienced goods here is the fact that all the competition among providers in an experienced good market is based on what? How do we compete with each other? What do we, how do we market our, our, our products and our services? We, we, well, yeah, but we don't. Yeah, we don't. Yeah. That's that's part of it. The team is, you, well, what we do is we we compete with each other on the basis of our reputations for quality. Right? Uh, that's the name of the game. All right. Uh, what kind of reputation among students um, uh, do do we have and families do we have? Now notice this. 
if everybody knew, could observe immediately what the quality was after they enrolled, what would you need with a reputation? You would know, right? You would know immediately. So the only way that you can maintain reputation competition is because the consumer doesn't know what the quality is, what the underlying quality is. And so also there's a there's demonstrable financial incentive not to resolve that un uncertainty. And that's one of the reasons why we don't spend any real serious effort and have it for a very long time generating quality metrics. It's because it's not in our financial interest to do that. Okay, the last thing here is uh, a governance problem or an agency problem. Now, agency problem in economics is the situation where you hire somebody to do a job for you, and you go away and let them do their job, but what they may do is do the job with their own interests in mind rather than yours. So you're the principal, and you're hiring an agent to do this for you. So the problem, the principal agent problem, is that the, the interests of the two are not properly aligned with each other. This is classic problem in for-profit firms. You have seen hundreds of cases of principal agent problems reported in the press. They don't ever call it that, but that's what it is when you find uh, uh, CEOs being prosecuted for abusing uh, the, uh, the stockholders uh, of, a, of a publicly traded corporation, for instance. You have a public, you have a principal agent problem every time you vote for a politician. You're hiring that person to go to the state house or to Washington D.C. to do a job for you, to represent you and your interests. But what happens when they get to D.C.? Whose interest do they pursue? All right. So this problem exists everywhere. It's a common human problem, and so it's not going to be any real surprise we find that uh, the problem also persists in higher education because we are no stronger morally uh, than anybody else, right? even though we like to think we are. Now, so why do you think higher education has been allowed for so long to not have the same accountability standards as K-12? Because uh, we have, it's kind of like the way we feel about um, agriculture and living on the farm and, and it's sort of a romantic it's feeling. Point. Yeah, it's the yeah. fact that we, you know, that we've always trusted um, uh, Mr. Chips and uh, that everybody who's involved in, in teaching and things like that, you know, have the students' interests first and foremost in their heart. And there's still, trust me, there are scores, thousands of people in higher education who do literally have that. But you all know, the faculty members in here, you all know that there are members of the faculty, for example, who do not. Not a large number, but a significant number that would make problems for everybody else. Now, every place I've worked, and I've worked in uh, Carnegie One research institutions and uh, Carnegie Two research institutions, and I've worked in a private uh, liberal arts college, it's everywhere. Okay, that problem is. All right. Now, what this is is sort of what reputation competition gets you to. All right. Uh, and you can, I want to make the point of what an adverse incentive structure this is. What's measured here on this vertical, oops, this cut off, this one. What that is, is it's the spending per student, okay, by the institution. Each one of these dots represents an institution. What's measured on the, this is U.S. News and World Report's reputation score. Now that is this, the, the uh, score given by deans and presidents and things like that to different institutions where they do this survey every year. Uh, and the higher that reputation score is, the higher the quality is, is. So what this shows you right here is the positive correlation that, that exists. In fact, it looks to me like it's nonlinear. You know, I don't know why we had to fit a straight line through that. You know, if I had to do the econometrics, I'd put a, a log linear uh, function through it. But it, it illustrates the point that what the public thinks and what people think is that the more the institution spends, the higher the quality. Now think what kind of adverse incentive that is for all colleges and universities. That says you need to work as fast as you can to raise as much money as you can and spend it just as fast as you can because the more money you spend per student, the higher is going to be your ranking. Now what would happen to a institution competing in an environment like that that said, I'm not going to do that. I 
am going to really bear down on cost and I'm going to provide a high quality experience for students at a much lower cost. How would students and their families interpret cost cutting? If they associate higher spending with higher quality, what are they going to assume is going on? Quality is going down. So in other words, you'd be shooting yourself in the foot if you try to do that. So the incentive, because of reputation competition, works exactly in the opposite direction from where it should. It tends to accelerate the, uh, the cost increases, rather than being a natural break on the cost increases. No right. Ford focuses in higher education. <laughs> <laughs> said there's no Ford focuses in higher education. No Ford focuses in higher education. <laughs> and, and because we don't really make an effort to try to, to come up with really objective kinds of, uh, uh, of uh, metrics for quality, you know, it makes it almost impossible to make a case that you are producing higher quality. Okay, now, what's the obvious next question as a scientist at this point. We've got these four theories, all right, and the two big dogs are Baumel and Bowen, okay, 